טוב. שלום וצהריים טובים. ברוכים הבאים לצל קורותינו, או לפתיחת אירועים סביב כנס צ'ייס למחקרי טכנולוגיות למידה 2009, תחת הכותרת האדם הלומד בעידן הטכנולוגי. הכנס עצמו התקיים ביום רביעי, מי שלא נרשם, שיבוא להירשם און סייט, משום שההרשמה כרגע כבר התמלאנו, אבל אפשר עוד להירשם. ובמסגרת אירועי הכנס, אנחנו נוהגים לקיים לפני הכנס או אחריו, בדרך כלל לפני, הרצאות שניתנות על ידי המרצה האורח של אותו כנס, בנושאים שהכנס מתעסק בהם, בנושאים שהמרצה הזה עוסק בהם. השנה, סביב אירועי הכנס, בחרנו להתמקד, כל שנה אנחנו בוחרים נושא מסוים להתמקד בו, והשנה בחרנו להתמקד בנושא שקשור באחד התופעות החמות של החברה הטכנולוגית שלנו, אלה הרשתות החברתיות, אותן רשתות דיגיטליות שהחליפו את התקשורת החברתית פנים אל פנים, או החבר'ה מהמילואים, או דברים מהסוג הזה. אותן רשתות שכעת אנחנו יכולים לפעול בהן במסגרות שהן לא, בהן אנחנו לא נפגשים פנים אל פנים, הם נפגשים באופן רימוט, והמון שאלות נגזרות מכך, למשל, מאיפה אתה יודע, עם מי אתה מדבר, איך אנחנו מתקשרים, כיצד אנחנו מייצרים תקשורת אפקטיבית בעזרת יציר, סיגנלים או תקשורת, אמצעי תקשורת שהם טקסטואליים בלבד, או תמונות שהן לא התמונות האמיתיות שלנו. איך אתם קוראים מסרים מהסוג הזה, כל אלה שאלות ועוד רבות אחרות שקשורות לטכנולוגיה חדשה יחסית, מי שיחשוב על זה מלפני עשר שנים לא יודע, אין דבר כזה בכלל, והם חלק מהרבה תופעות נוספות של ידידות, של קבוצות דיון וכולי, והשנה הזמנו את פרופסור ג'ודי דאנה מ-MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, שהיא מומחית בעל רקורד בינלאומי בתחום, שתיתן לנו את שתי ההרצאות ה-pre-conference, ההרצאה אחת לפני הכנס ואחת שתפתח את הכנס. פרופסור, ועכשיו אני אסוויץ' to English, and I will read it from paper, sorry. פרופסור ג'ודי דונאט is the director of the social media research group at the MIT Media Lab and the faculty fellow at the Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Her work focuses on the social side of computing, and she is known internationally for pioneering research in social visualization, interface design, and computer-mediated interaction. She created several of the early social applications for the web, including the first postcard service, the electronic postcard, the first interactive jury art show portraits in the cyberspace, Um, her work with social media group has, uh, has been exhibited at the, at the gallery at the Institute of uh, Contemporary Art in Boston and several New York galleries. She was the director of uh, ID slash entity, um, uh, a collaborative exhibit uh, um, installations exa examining how science and technology are transforming uh, portraiture. Her current research focuses on, on creating expre expressive visualization for social interaction and on building experimental environments that mix real and virtual experiences. She has a book in progress about how we signal identity in both mediated and face-to-face -face interactions. Dr. Donath received her doctoral and master's degrees in media arts and sciences from MIT. Her bachelor's degree is in history from Yale University, and has, she has worked professionally as a designer and a builder of uh, educational software and experimental media. And of all this long uh, record that comes from, uh, from the theoretical and the practical world, uh, Dr. Donat will talk to us today about one of the aspects uh, of her work. It will be called Visible Interactions, the design of uh, social uh, media. Judith, please. So, thank you very much. Um, as Yoram was saying, I'll be speaking primarily about the design work that I've done today. Today, today I'll be talking primarily about the design work that I've done and putting it into a general context of how we perceive other people 
and what kinds of online spaces and experiences we want to create. Now I just need to find. I'm just, uh, sorry. Okay, I've got it. There, okay, it's me. <laughs> okay, so um, Winston Churchill is not primarily known as an architecture critic, but this particular quote was very useful. He says, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. And it's really a, a statement about the power of different styles of architecture to really create culture around it. And to some extent, I'm going to be using this as a challenge in terms of how does that compare with the way that the design of virtual environments shapes the people who use them. So for some examples of how buildings shape us, you can look at something like a classroom. You know, and it's something I'm sure all of you here at an educational institution are very aware of, how carefully you take different classroom arrangements because you want to create a different experience for the students within them. There's the one that says all the students are at little desks facing forward to one lecturer who you know, is the person in charge. It changes your understanding of the entire situation if you move those desks into a circle, in which case the rules about who's in charge, who has authority, become very different. The structure of a stadium is about creating excitement within crowds. You know, and, and it changes the behavior of people. Both the scale of the groups will let people behave in ways that they don't typically do when they're in much smaller groups. The way you can do different stadium seating to emphasize or de-emphasize the antagonism between different sides. You know, there's all different ways of setting it up to create large social effects by how people are seated and the way they see each other. You know, and you know, this is just another example. There's a cafe. You can see examples of cafes like this on every continent. And one, one interesting piece of it certainly is how people behave in terms of watching each other. How do they know the rules about where to sit, how to sit down, who, how, who you can look at, how much you can watch other people? What of those spaces, for instance, we'll get into this at the end of the talk, what of those spaces is private, what's public? You know, where, in what places can you sit with other people? When does it make sense to pretend that you can't hear the next conversation? You know that you know all the rules, in, you know, intuitively after spending some time, or it's actually a lot of what we teach children about. Though you're sitting here and you can hear these people, you really cannot comment on their conversation, etc. So, to that extent, our buildings and our architecture, our furnishings, do shape us. But what I'd like to argue is that interface design shapes online culture in a much, much more profound way. Because it's not just setting the situation. When you look at those people, they're still the same. You see their faces, you might not see, you, don't, you can look at them and see their face, but you cannot see their bank account. You can't see their name. But in an online world, it's up to the designer of the space really to say almost everything about what can happen in that space. So in some, you see people by faces. In some, you only see them by their name. And what you can read of those names is very different. So for instance, some of those spaces, the names might be verified. You have to use a credit card to sign up. And it's going to make, they're going to make sure that it's, as much as possible, your real name. And in some others, nobody's name, real name is used. Um, if it's a face, you know, is it a photographic face? Is it coming live from a camera? Or is it as made up as any of the pseudonymous names? Um, whether you can see the size of the audience, for instance, has a tremendous effect. So for instance, a lot of the charm of many online spaces is that you feel like you're only talking to two or three other people whose interests you share, who you like, though your audience is actually huge. It could be thousands of people. So you get these very intimate conversations among two or 3,000 people. But it also means that you may say, say things that you really wouldn't have had you really been thinking of it. So there's, and so you can design a space where you really are aware of that number, or the designer can really manipulate it to make it invisible. Are your words permanent or ephemeral? That's actually going to be a lot of what I talk about in the next part of it, when I talk about some of the designs we do. But whether you feel that when you say something, is it going to disappear forever, or is it effectively becoming part of your persona? So the rest of the talk I'm dividing into three pieces, history and body, realism as an abstraction, and private and public, to look at some of the designs my students and I have done in the context of 
thinking about some of these large questions of how different types of designs affect uh, social behavior online. So the first part is about history. And what I'm going to say here is that history really works as a virtual body. I mean, one of the most, if you had to pick one thing that's really different about online society is that there's no body, it's not a physical space. And there's two really big implications of that. One is that in the real world, the body is really the center of social control. You know, to some extent where it comes right down to it, you, you can control people, you can build fences. You can say this person has misbehaved horribly and they will be in jail. At some level, everything about how society is controlled really comes down to a physical body. Only online there is nothing like that. Um, and secondly, is that, um, so, and the other part is that the body is extremely expressive. So a lot of what you learn from others is how they move, their facial expression, etc. And so what I want to argue here is that what we have in an information world as opposed to a physical world is we have history. Most of our conversations, unless somebody is recording it, most of our conversations face to face are ephemeral. They disappear. You say something and it's really gone for all of history. Online, the norm is different. Much of what you say is archived. So it's, it's rather permanent. And so one of the things we can do is we can take that history and say that it, it really becomes like your body. Once you've spent a long time in a particular discussion group or emailing with an individual person, you have this long trail of information. So the way the body metaphor works is first, this history is very expressive. Unlike saying, I'm a nice person or I'm really funny, it really is that record of, are you supportive, are you kind? There's a lot of very personal individuality within it, one. And secondly, while not perhaps as valuable to you as your body, it really becomes a thing of, of value. You, if you've built up a reputation, you've helped a lot of people, you've had a long correspondence, you've been in a particular community for a long time, that history, even if you're working under a pseudonym, the reputation that you have acquired through that history is very valuable to you and, and becomes a reason to want to maintain the good reputation of that online persona. So one of the questions that we've addressed is how do you look at that history? You see it, you know, it's all this text. It's not particularly attractive or useful, something you want to look at again. So we've developed a whole series of visualizations which I'm going to talk about now for looking at it in a different way. This one, people always have really liked. It's called People Garden, um, and it's very problematic. So I want to talk about both why it's attractive and why it's problematic. This was done by a student named Rebecca Ziong, and what it shows is that um, she was looking at online discussion groups, and here each flower represents an individual person. The height of the um, stem shows how long they've been participating in the group. The, diff the petals are their individual postings, and the color of the petals shows whether they have, um, whether they're responding to other people or just starting a new discussion. So what's very nice about it is it's very, very intuitive. You can look at this, and when we, a part of our goal here was to be able to look at different discussion spaces and be able to see very quickly which ones were very thriving spaces and which ones were rather um, abandoned or they had just turned into an argument between two people. And you can see all this and you can see it very intuitively. If there's just one petal on a couple of spindly stems, it's not a very healthy group. And the ones that have all different heights of plants and lots and lots of petals show there's newcomers, oldcomers, and it looks like a healthy garden. Um, the problem with this as a metaphor is that the flowerness kind of is, makes a big statement about what type of space it is. So that in terms of interaction, it's very telling. It also means it's, a, it's very nice for a supportive group, you know, to say, oh, well, we're going to represent you as a garden. But when you, what happens here is this can also be representative of many of the groups that we were looking at that were incredibly contentious, where people were talking about very controversial issues and very angry at each other in a very lively way, and they still look like flowers. So, <laughs> still look a nice garden. So um, one of the issues here, and oh, again I'll return to it, is that is this interesting tension 
um, this will be the main theme of the second part of the lecture, but this sets it up, between legibility and abstraction. Here you have something that's very legible, but the metaphor that we use is a little overwhelming. So what you want to do sometimes for things like this is to find something that's equally legible, but perhaps doesn't overwhelm with its sort of metaphorical fragrance. Um, so here's just you know, two different groups using this one. Um, this piece is, um, let's say, email visualizations, though while it's less pretty to look at, it uh, removed some of that excessive meta metaphoricalness from it. This is a piece called Theme Mail, and it's an interface and visualization for looking at relationships within email. And what it does here is it, where, where we started here was also looking at the phenomenon that many people tend to keep enormous amounts of email. They keep it all the time. They don't just, and if you ask people, why do you keep all this email? They'll say, oh, there must be something important here. You know, there's important email I haven't had a chance to sort it through. But we were a little suspicious of that. We sort of felt that there's another real meaning for why people save all this stuff. Because a lot of what you have in this archive are messages that say things like, oh, can we meet for lunch at 12.15 instead of at 12? I'm running late. It's not important, each individual message, but there is something about having all of these that people like to have. It is this record of relationships. And so the idea here was to make a way of looking at email archives that unlike most email systems which focus on search, where you want, you want that message about that one conference or something, that really was about looking at the relationships among people. So what this does is you feed it all your email, and then you can pick a particular person. Um, this is part of my discussions with Fernando over a series of years. And um, each column, it's a little hard to see here, but each, it's a little hard to read, unfortunately, here. But each column, is, represents two, um, six months of words that you used. And what it does is it reuse textual analysis to say, what words do you use with uncommon frequency with this person? So we first looked at all the words in English, then we looked at also all the words in all of your email. And so we knew what you used, tended to use commonly. And then looked at what you used overall with that person. So it turns out that Fernanda and I would use the words project, thanks, meetings, SMG, which is sort of for social media group, visualization, an awful lot in our email. So those sort of fade into the background. Those are kind of the big themes of our mail. But then month by month, it shows what words you use. And so what it gives you is this interesting record of the types of things you talked about over time. And because the shape has to do with um, how, this is just her email with someone else, if the shape has to do with how much mail you sent at a particular time, um, you, you get to see the patterns in the interactions. What's interesting also um, that we found when we did user studies of this was that people were also very willing to show other people this. While email is normally a very private interaction between two people, you don't show your email to somebody else, these visualizations, because they were focused on single words, um, people felt that they weren't private anymore. They were effectively like, it let you have a snapshot of this relationship, and that was a very interesting piece. And I think what happened was a lot of people felt, you know, we like to take pictures. If you go on vacation with a friend, you take a picture together, so you have this record. We were here together, you know, here we are arm in arm. But you, as we carry out more of our lives online, there isn't an equivalent of that kind of snapshot. And a, Visualization such as this provides that kind of snapshot of a relationship. We can say, I can, you know, they would, the, our experimental subject says, you know, I wanted to, you know, I've printed these out and put these on the wall of my office. You know, so they really do function as snapshots, which sort of led to, we hadn't, we haven't followed up on that, but I think it's an interesting open question of thinking about really how do you represent <coughs> these relationships in ways that have the social function of photography in real life. Um, just another example of it. Um, this one, I'm, I think it's good. A little, sh um, let me skip to this one. Um, this is another one. You know, getting back to that question of history. This is, you know, for many of you can recognize the network diagram in here. These are actually drawn from visualizations of um, the close-ups of some visualizations of MySpace networks. And here, one of the things we were interested in 
was trying to take that notion of history to understand the problem of what is the meaning of these links between people. Um, you know, for those, any of you who've looked at, so, do social network work or have looked even casually at social networks and social network diagrams, one of the issues is that you have the nodes that are the people and then you have this link and there's seldom much information about what the real meaning of those links are. You say this is a connection. Um, and in particular, looking at things like online social networks, when you look at them quickly, you could say, well, this person, you know, people like studying them because they're online, they're easy to find, you can get these big network diagrams, but you have no idea whether this connection is between two people who've never met each other, have barely heard of each other, made this link, forgot about it forever, or these are two best friends. And so what we did here was start to try and understand some of that meaning between the links by putting in information about how much correspondence was going on between the people who are connected. So the, um, the dots that you see here, this one, and these are, okay, it's a little blurry here, but these are actual um, words, are, are drawn from the messages that people have sent to each other, and it animates. And so what you get here is instead of looking at the network map as the end result, it becomes a sort of a conceptual map of relationships on which you can see this animation of how information runs on them. And so by adding that, that additional information in, it becomes a lot more meaningful, at least within that particular context, what the connections are. And so there, you know, part of the idea is to say, as we start thinking about things like, you know, network maps are, are very popular, we see them everywhere, but to start thinking about how do you use elements of the history of how those connections were made to start making those maps have more elements within that link than simply its existence. Um, so some of the work that we've done here in this notion of history um, gets back at that question of portraiture. You know, as I mentioned, female was a portrait of relationships. This one I'm just showing quickly just to bring up this whole particular area that we're working in that's called data portraiture. This one is drawn from Twitter. Um, how many of you are familiar with Twitter? So most, but not all. So a quick update. So Twitter is one of the very sort of currently popular set of things called microblogs, where instead of writing entire paragraphs of things, you um, can get online, write, in the case of Twitter, it's basically a sentence, 140 characters at a time updates about what you're doing, what you're thinking, something you've seen interesting, anything whatsoever. So, um, and people talk about all kinds of different things, but Twitter is also this funny, and you, when you look at it, you, you choose to follow certain people and you just see these updates coming in from all these people, and it's very scattered, and it's also very hard, again, to get a picture of who, who any one individual is. So what this is, this is actually an art installation, but it takes the words that people are using at the moment in their Twitter updates, and it creates this, I mean, it's head-shaped, so it really does feel like it's a huge wall, that you're in this big crowd of people, and you see the words and phrases that any one person is uploading, and then you sort of see, it's actually about a year's worth of words go into one of these heads. And so as you see this, you start to see, and the larger ones are words they've used more often. So you start to see that you know, there's the person who every day starts off the day saying, I'm out going out for coffee now. The coffee was really tasty today. The people who are constantly traveling, they're at the airport, their plane is always late. The people who are talking about their work, the people who are talking about their computer crashing. So you, start, you, you see both the particular individuals and then you can start seeing also overall what happens when there's, a, for instance, a big news story and all of a sudden lots and lots of people, instead of being in their own individual worlds, are all talking about the same thing. So it really lets you see it as a whole field of vision. Um, so one more on the um, micro updates here is that, you know, as I said, what we're interested in here is this notion of history and time. And one of the things with something like Twitter, especially if you're not visualizing it, it's always about right now. It's a very ahistorical um, interface in many ways, that a lot of these things are about what are you doing now? What do you think about this minute? Disconnected from anything else. 
And so here we created a piece called Microcosm, which is a different take on, on status updates. And this is something it's, um, if you, I'll show you a URL at the end of where my site, my student site, our work site is. And this is, a, is live, it's online. There's, I think, about a thousand users of it now. But instead of using words um, as to do your micro, these status updates, here it's using statistical graphs. And there's a set of different graphs you can choose from your basic pie charts and line charts and you know, different types of basic graphs. And you can create a graph about anything you want and update it. And so what it is, it's, it's actually, for, especially for a social scientist, I think a fascinating site to look through because it's, instead of creating a daily, you know, this sort of constant update, people will start to update, you know, for instance here, origins of food. This is someone who's kept, keeps every day a record of where they ate lunch. Is that their mother's house, mom's food, leftovers, ate at the neighbor's, ate at Roseanne's house, aches and pains. Where, where do they have aches and pains? Over, you know, just the course of one day after another. And, but I think what's interesting here, I mean, some of it's very funny. There were a couple of, for us, there were a couple of motivations. It wasn't just about history. Part of it was to see, um, we're interested in this idea of, you know, if we're using computers, which have a lot of expressive capability, but we really use them primarily as glorified typewriters. You, know, you just usually write text the same you could do with a typewriter, but there is a whole graph world of graphics and graphs that people could use, and, but they don't tend to use them every day. So we were interested in, in seeing how could people use statistical graphs expressively, and it turns out there's lots of ways that they can. You know, someone, there's people who track how often they look themselves up on Google versus how often they look themselves up on Facebook. You know? um, so there's a whole bunch of things you can do. I think the other, the other interesting part, though, is it also means that while people are doing these updates, it's about keeping track of things over time, to say this is a long-term piece. If you don't, if you don't keep updating something, it's, it's not very interesting, but you start to create a self-portrait through these kind of daily, long-term updates of what you've done, where you've eaten. Some of them are very mundane, some of them are really fascinating. They're like, you know, ideas people have thought about, things they've observed in the world around them. But a lot of it is also that kind of mundane piece. Because when you think about what we get in looking at other people and being around others in a face-to-face -face world, it's not necessarily the big, exciting things that are important. But a lot of it is the kind of mundane pieces. You know, that we just get a sense of how many people are doing this one thing or another. What is the mood of the space? You know, are people looking interested? Are they looking bored? But it's very, very mundane pieces, but just lots and lots of it makes for the richness of the world around us. So part of it here is about saying it's not necessarily about making a medium in which we expect everybody to say something profound at every minute, but that there comes some kind of profundity over the course of many, many mundane observations. Okay, so the second theme I want to develop here comes from, this is a quote, it's actually a paper title from a 1992 human interface paper called Beyond Being There by Jim Holland and Steve Stornetta. And if you have not read this paper, it's, I, highly, I highly recommend it. I think it's a brilliant design paper. And what they were talking about in this paper, this is 1992, they were writing it at um, the height of video, people were trying to do a lot of better, improving video conferencing. And they made this argument that said, well, you know, if we keep trying to make things that are kind of like being there, you know, just to make things as close to realism as possible, we're always going to be second rate. It's always going to be better to actually be there and to actually be in that person's presence. But what we really should be doing with social interfaces is trying to get something that's called beyond being there. What are the things that you can do by having the computer as your medium that you cannot do face to face with someone? So you know, they made their um, goal to be things where the interface led so much to the um, interaction that you would choose to use it even when you could be face to face. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be bigger and louder and more 3D than the real world. You, if you look at probably your daily uh, experience, one of the things that really does go beyond being there is plain email. You know, a lot of, I mean, I'm sure all of you have had the experience of realizing that you have a colleague 
you know, two offices down or a spouse across the dining room table and you've emailed them instead of speaking to them because there was something about email that was different about being there. It, either you didn't want a response right away or you wanted to make sure they had this information in a handy form you could, they could keep or something, but it's because it was different than the face-to-face -face interaction that even though you could speak to them, you chose to um, use a medium instead. So, but there's many, many, many possible designs that can do this, and so we have used this a lot as a challenge to think about how we want to approach interface design and how we want to deal with different metaphors. When I started my research group, it was in 1997, and one of the most popular, or at least talked about among people doing social media and, and a few people online, was a site called The Palace, which was... Um, 1990, circa 1997 VR, little 3D heads and spaces, and you could pick an avatar and, and speak through them. And um, this is when we first, my, part of it, you know, part of one of the things about design, to, you know, you always will get when you talk to designers or architects, is it's subjective. So some, some things are um, very scientifically studied, and some things are a matter of design and taste. And we set out to be sort of the anti-palace, the anti-avatar design group, in part because, um, and things I wish I could go into much more depth on Wednesday, we felt that what the avatars were adding was a little bit of color, but actually mostly ways, they were mostly just confusing because people would really, you, once, as humans, when we see a face, we will read a lot into it. We'll read age, we'll read gender, we'll read kindness or lack of kindness or anything, and these are not very well thought out faces, and even if they are, they don't have expression that matches what you're saying. And so by applying the face on top of the actual interaction, which was still text, you were just giving it a sort of tone that wasn't particularly deliberate. And so what we were interested in, though, was saying that, yes, there were real advantages of graphical, of having some kind of spatial graphical interface, but could we do this without the faces? And so what we came up with is a piece called Chat Circles, um, which is still, it's, this is also available online to use. It's been in constant use on and off since for the last 10 or 11 years. Um, and what we did here, it's a pretty simple one, is that um, people just picked a color, and you appeared as a, color, a colored circle. But it did a couple of interesting things. One, um, your circle expanded and contracted as you typed in it. So simply the act of being active and your words stayed in them for a while and then they faded away. So it had a certain temporal quality. It wasn't like your words just appeared and disappeared, but they also didn't stay on until you spoke the next time. So they, there was a certain fading to them. The most interesting part, though, you know, it's a relatively small piece, was that it had hearing range. So if you notice um, on the far left, you see that the circles are hollow. You, in here, you, the person who is you has the white circle. So this is the user. The ones here, you can see the words in, and they're solid because there's hearing range. And so you can only see the words of the people who are near, near to you. And the people who are far away, you can't see their words. What this does is it gives the spatiality meaning. And this was one of our arguments about the palace and some other things like it, was they would do things like they'd say, well, this should be a sitting room. Here's a picture of a sofa. But the avatars don't need sofas, and the sofa didn't have any different behaviors. So it referenced the idea of, of sitting, as we do, without actually thinking about how the interface could have different, of what Don Norman and some others have called affordances. And so here is the idea of hearing range is an actual affordance in that virtual world that says, OK, what we can do is this will give you natural conversational groupings because the people who want to speak to each other have to move to be near each other. If you don't like what someone's saying, you can actually walk away from them in a meaningful way and visibly ignore them. And so it was that notion that we've tried to kind of follow through about how do you make things where you're not just referring to actions in the real world, but that the actual behavior of the space gives people a reason for acting. Um, Another one that was a little bit like this, I'm actually going to, just for the sake of time, um, skip this one um, and talk about some other pieces. So these are some related issues here. 
um, with this issue of legibility and abstraction. So we skip ahead 10 years. And we have something that in many ways is a lot like the palace, only with much, much better graphics. We have Second Life, which I don't know how popular it is in Israel, but it was quite popular. Is it? Do you, do you all, are you all familiar with it? Yes, mostly. Okay. So Second Life is a 3D virtual world. It's much more immersive, everything, but again, it's an avatar world. So while it's much fancier, you still have some of the same problems, which are that the people's appearance is completely by choice. The facial expressions don't necessarily um, have anything to do with what the user is feeling, though there's a little bit more sophistication, which is both um, good and bad in how they um, act. So for instance, you see all these people, um, I'm going to talk about this again on Wednesday, but it's an interesting poem. They're all sitting together, and they all have their knees crossed in the same way, like this. Um, and what's interesting about that is you know, especially for those of you who study social psychology, when you sit in a room and people mimic each other, it's a real sign of kind of group cohesiveness. You know, so if you're talking to someone and you go like this, and you realize they're going like this, if you look at people who are really getting along, they tend to mimic each other a lot. Here, you're seeing that mimicry, and it's fairly subtle, but it's all being done programmatically. It has nothing to do with whether those people are agree with each other or are paying attention, but the program says one of the things that happens when you sit in this kind of chair is your legs get crossed this way. Um, it was actually, we, we did a whole study of chairs in Second Life, because if you notice, it's full of, we, one of the things we noticed as we looked around, it's full of chairs. You know, an avatar does not get tired, but it, there's an awful lot of chairs in Second Life, and we, we got interested in that, and I think, I mean, we haven't done the most in-depth study of it, but I think one of the reasons where it goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning, that whole question of, of essentially architectural legibility, is that they do serve a purpose that's not about you know, giving avatars feet a rest, but is that chairs are a lot of the way we are able to define behavior within a space. So. Um, this is actually from the space of, I'm, I'm a fellow at Berkman Law School, and this is Berkman Law School in Second, Second Life. They actually do a lot of lectures in it. And so you know that you come in, you know that you sit in a particular space, you can express something about your participation by sitting in the front or sitting in the back. So what the chair does is that while, they, while there may be other ways of doing it, by defining a space with chairs, it does give people this very legible notion of you know, is this a lecture hall, is this a group discussion, is this a cafe for wa watching other people? But the problem is, if you go back to that notion of going beyond being there, is that once you start making a lot of your statements through real life things, you end up with this copy of real life behaviors. So then you have a online lecture hall in which people come in and they sit down in the chair and they listen to the lecture. It's, a, it's an imaginary space. You could do anything. You could think of all kinds of things that people could be doing. They could be, have all different kinds of note-taking or collaboration, but because you have kind of slavishly mimicked what you do in real life, where some of those things are impossible, you've really limited your creativity in terms of what could be done in that space. There's some housing architecture there, which is the one other point I wanted to make Well, about Second Life which is that the other thing that it is good at, before I say you know, we should get rid of all this realism, it does do a good job of letting people express their taste. The other thing that there was is in Second Life Beyond, lots and lots of chairs, there's an enormous number of people whose houses are finished in marble. You know, everyone's house has this beautiful marble and kind of gold faucets. So, uh, because you don't have the constraint of marble being expensive. It's just as hard to do wood texture mapping as marble texture mapping. Um, but so what's interesting, it, it is very good at giving people a way of expressing taste um, without, having the, without actually having to pay the expense of doing that. But other than that, it really limits what you could do. This is an example of some of the things we've attempted to do within that space to address um, some of those other issues. So this is, um, we've called it information spaces, and it's a second life area. But so putting chairs in it, what we said was, this one is set up as a discussion space. And depending on where you stand, this shows two things, agree and disagree, but you could make it as multidimensional as possible. And so it's for someone can give a lecture, or you can have a discussion here, 
but let's see if I have a better image, it's a little easier to see. Um, depending on where you stand, it votes. It's a little hard to see there. Yeah, but, um, so you can see the instantaneous um, voting of any time. Since avatars can move a lot easier than we can, while it might be tiring to have a discussion where you were at, on a real um, football field and had to keep running from end to end to say what you think, there it's actually quite easy. And so what it means is that as you're listening, you can kind of say, okay, I'm going to move over here. No, that's a good point. That's a bad point. So when people have conversations in that space, by the flow of where they are, you can, you can start seeing you know, how different discussions are being swayed or not. Now, obviously, this is good for some types of discussions and not others, um, but for particular types of decision-making and collaborative work, it works really well. What you also see here is that... Um, those little dots moving up are each one of those boxes is when someone has made a statement. So you can see who are the active participants in this conversation, whether, for instance, in this case here, all of the people who've been speaking a lot are all on the disagreeing side. Um, some of the other cases you can't see here, we did things where you could be handed tasks, and so that you can have a meeting where people are, you know, for instance, planning a conference and assigning tasks to people, and you could see the different tasks piling up in front of them. And so again, part of the idea here was to say, what are the ways that we could start taking a space like Second Life that has enough pieces of familiarity to give people a start? You're not in a completely blank slate. You know about space, you know about things like fields, but to be able to move beyond just the experience of you know, sitting in a chair or you know, having your avatar mimic what it's like to be you sitting in a chair. Um, just another quick one, this is, was an interesting one, because here it's a, another Second Life experiment. This one was looking at um, virtual soccer, but also how well, this is foosball, table soccer, and um, how well could people learn rules and cooperate? And the problem we were looking at here was um, the way this works, it's a mixed reality piece where all your teams are made up of some people in real life and some people in the virtual space. Um, and the idea here was we wanted to make it so that the people in the virtual space also had real power on the team. And while, it, you know, yes, while you know, table soccer is not actually the most important thing in the world, the lessons we were trying to get at here I think are important for a lot of different kinds of meetings because I think one of the things we will be seeing increasingly are these mixed reality spaces. You know, you'll have a, a meeting, but some of the participants will be you know, coming in remotely. You'll be working on a team, and some of the participants will be collaborating remotely. And part of the problem is, is that remote, people who are remote tend to have much less of a level of participation. So the issue here is to how can we set up the rules so that you have a team where you, you had to have both the virtual and the real ones, and how could also, how could we have this run and make it make sense to people intuitively? So not to have you know, a huge set of instructions how to work it out, but let them figure out the rules and make them up as they went. You know, it's, it's meant to be like table soccer. You know, it's not something where there's, people know the rules, but how would they work this out? They had to work out for themselves. And so a lot of it turned out, in, um, I don't know if I have a close up of this, but um, a lot of it here was, for instance, what we did was we made it so that the only way you could, um, as you turn this, you would, um, you would turn those men on the sticks. So the real players could turn the, the pieces on the stick, but they couldn't kick. And so by giving different levels of power to the real and virtual people, they figured out how to cooperate. And so part of what we're working on from here is how do you take some of those things and, for instance, learn in um, doing a collaborative project. You know, for instance, if you're in a meeting like that, if you then build systems where the note-taking can only be done by the remote participants, or the person in charge of saying who should speak next is remote, it really changes their role and they become much more of a full participant by being given particular types of power like that within the um, situation. And so finally, what I want to talk about is that question of um, public and private spaces again. And so here, you know, we talked a little, you know, I mentioned a little bit at the beginning 
in talking about cafes, about how we follow these interesting and unspoken rules about what is a private space and what's public. And the issue of privacy is a tremendous one online, and it's one where there's, there's always this huge sort of tension between the idea of, like, for instance, we have a lot of real, very real privacy issues come stemming from that whole issue of history. Because most privacy violation has to do with taking something out of the context to which it was intended. Once something is said and then archived, its original context has kind of moved on or moved back into the sort of disappearing mists of history, but you still have those words there. So they may be taken out of context and shown in the future. That's what people keep warning teenagers about, about putting you know, nude pictures of themselves online. You know, that the context of that party, it's very funny. In the context of job hunting in five years, it's going to be much less funny. Um, so there's all these different contextual changes. But without, you know, and while there's a lot of attention paid to the private, without public space, you really have no society. You know, a lot of the excitement of the online world is that it's this huge public. And without public space, you have really little um, way of being able to see the mores um, in how to behave, being able to watch what other people are doing. Um, you know, showing chat circles again here just for the introduction for this, because a lot of what it was about was about being able to sort of quickly create private space, just be able to have a private conversation. You know, part of it is you can walk away from someone you don't want to hear. It also meant you could have a large open space, but then two people could move into a corner to have a private conversation. We did an um, audio version of this where it was really remarkable because it's like audio conferencing. You have eight people online, but then two can just move to a corner and they can have a private conversation and move back. So there, it, the hollowed circles make this notion of private and public very, very visceral. But in other cases, uh, there's ways in which the technologies are much more of a intrusion into um, what makes for private or public spaces in ways that can be both good and bad. So we talk about a couple of projects here that really sort of push the boundaries of what, type, what, things, what types of spaces we have. And in particular, what I'm interested in here is a experiments in terms of a future where, you know, if you think about it, it's a lot of these issues around public and private aren't limited to the screen. These are all pieces that start to go beyond the screen. But what we think of now as our public spaces are starting to become much more wired. You know, if you go, um, you know, if you go out in public, there'll be increasing numbers, not just for security, but if there's a camera that's meant to show where you are to another place. Or there's people with camera phones. You know, your notion of how much and where your image or your words are is starting to change quite a bit. So with agoraphone, this was a student's thesis project. What she did here was, it was technically very simple, but um, she made this sculpture and put it in a public, public square, square. And what you could do is you could telephone the sculpture and just talk to whoever was there. And um, so as well as people are doing this talking, someone had called, they don't know who it is, um, but someone has called and is talking to them. And what it was, it was interesting, this was done several years ago, just as cell phones were becoming very ubiquitous. So what is also really unclear was whether you might be speaking to the person on the bench next to you, who's talking on the cell phone, you don't realize that's the person who's talking to you out there, or you could be talking to somebody in California, but it was, it was creating this kind of intrusion from other spaces into the center of a public sphere. In this case, what was interesting was that it, the use of it was mainly very, very positive. Somebody decided to make a radio broadcast where you know, every Monday they would play jazz through it. They decided they'd have a little jazz concert and they liked to do that. Someone else did a little advice column and they would call and say, I, I'm, I'm going to give free advice here, just walk by. Um, you know, but, you know, but part of the issue here is, uh, and the idea of, with a plaza like this is, how do different technologies change the control of the space, of who can be there, who can speak into it, who can broadcast into it, how observed do, do people feel that they are. You know, we were doing this in a, a somewhat different context than thinking about public and private, is that um, we were thinking about, we were interested in the notion of how do you get people 
to be more engaged with others in public spaces, and this one did that quite well, was the notion of how, you, um, how a technology like this can break down some of the barriers between people. So this was a college campus. There'd be people who would sit there almost every day and eat lunch, but they would never speak to each other. And what we were trying to affect with this, which is what worked, was this notion of what we call a social catalyst, was that by bringing an odd object in like this, the people who were on the phone felt free to speak to people here because they were at a remove. Once there was the speaking sculpture here, it changed the nature of people in the spaces relationship to each other because they kind of felt that it was a public conversation that would happen there. And so, not for the whole plaza, but around it, what it did was it made a little sphere of public conversation where the barriers you normally have for speaking with strangers disappeared and people would be able to speak with each other face to face. And so, I mean, part of it is looking at how, how do technologies change that set of rules about, you know, where are those private boundaries and who can speak when. And particularly when you start to bring in these remote technologies, because they do have a different set of rules, you start being able to change um, the flavor of a public space. Um, this is an interface from a somewhat different way of um, moving a kind of intrusion into a public space. This was done in collaboration with a professor at UC Berkeley named Ken Goldberg, who mostly works with, um, he's a robotics professor, and he mostly works with um, web-controlled robots. So he wanted, to, he wanted to really think about the interface of controlling something that was not quite as dumb as a robot. Um, and so he came with that to us, and we worked together on this piece where instead, um, and he had done some experiments with this before, instead of controlling a robot, you are giving a person commands about what to do. You have an actor at the other end instead of a robot. So it's part performance piece, but part sort of an interesting social intervention. So what you see here is, um, we'll just start here. This is the control interface. So if you're the director, this is the interface you see. It's the camera from the actor's head. You see where they are. And then you have a bunch of people who can vote on what message should be sent to the actor to have them do. And so this is um, our um, very nice actress who put up with a lot. And so she has a camera on her head. She, has, she can read the instructions she's been given on her wrist. She, they also, the instructions are also printed out on her chest, which we found was important because otherwise the behavior was so inexplicable. Why is this person doing these things? That it was really useful for people to see what she had been told to do. Um, one of the issues, and she has, she's broadcasting sound, so one of the issues here is that it let a lot of people in a remote space take another person and say, all right, we want you to do all these things. And somewhat unsurprisingly, we got the kind of results you would think. We'd have a bunch of anonymous people telling another person what to do. This was at a sponsor dinner at our lab, and she got directions like, stand on the table and bark like a dog, or... Um, take a bite out of that, the, that sponsor's dinner. Um, so we thought, well, this is interesting. Um, it works very well as a provocative piece. It you know, perhaps has a limited appeal. So we did another version of it called the Telejournalist, um, which I think was interesting as an experiment. Was all we did, we didn't change what the person wore, but we changed some of the rules about the interface, in particular about agency. In the original version, we gave the actor no agency. They were just to listen. They were to act as much as possible like a very, very smart robot. But here, they had a lot more agency. What they could do, in particular, is that they could veto things. And they could say, no, that's a really bad idea. And once you, they vetoed something, the person who had suggested it um, actually lost their power to make suggestions or vote for some amount of time. So within the system, there was this punishment for even suggesting something that was in terribly bad taste. Um, and changed people's behavior remarkably. So then it became, you know, with iterations, it becomes a, a very interesting interface for being able to bring an aspect of reality at a remove to other people. So this one we could you know, see you know, as a meeting thing. You could say, well, we could have a group of people come in. It's about effectively direct representation, where 
you know, you have someone, you know, for instance, we thought we could use this in um, community meetings where a lot of people can't always attend, but they could send someone in and then that person would be empowered to ask questions on their behalf, to interrupt, to say no, to say yes, to do all kinds of things like that. But it again starts to um, bring in these very interesting questions about what is the private and what is public about these spaces and in particular, how do you understand the agency of the people within them? So I'd like to, um, at this point, open it up to questions. This is um, a, just a sketch from a piece that we're doing now. I don't have big ones because it's, um, it's just being installed as we are speaking here. It's a piece called Metro Pathologies, and it's, about, it's a big installation that's about living in an information world that um, I think we really are at the verge of where if you think about it right now, if you have a cell phone, at any moment you can be connected to a constant stream of world news, a constant stream of information about random individuals, status updates, what they're doing. You can be broadcasting a tremendous amount about what you're doing from little text updates to sort of live people. There's a lot of people who just send live video from their phone to Facebook and things. So we're living increasingly in a world where whether you're interested in it or not, all of our spaces are becoming some type of mixed reality. And we're both at the very exciting edge of being privy to more information than has ever before been possible, but also really having to change our notions of what's pu private, what's public, what's ephemeral, and um, how we interact with that. Thank you. Um, we've done, I mean, we've done a little bit of work with this. Um, I have a student who did a piece called Back Channel, where it's designed for a conference space like this, where the idea is that you can, you can put up slides and you have another screen, and we've used it at several conference, smaller conferences of, of this scale, where people can put up questions and comments as the person is speaking. Um, and it's wor it works quite well. I think the, the issue there, again, is that it certainly is a situation-changing piece. So a lot of what you want to think about is how, um, how you do that and still maintain focus on the speaker. Um, one of the things that's certainly useful, a lot of the conferences, certainly in, in the States, I don't know how prevalent it is here, it's calling this piece back channel was sort of a joke because what they call the back channel is a lot of times people will be in a conference in a, a channel of their own chatting away, sort of gossiping behind the speaker's back and the idea here was to put it up in public where you really had to kind of own your words if you want to. Um, and there's different versions with that where sometimes people can just put up comments or questions. There's others where it's used to do a live vote on what questions people want to hear. So I think um, part of it is also there is training speakers how to use that, because I think one of the things that's most useful about that is how it can change something, the whole format of the discussion, because you don't want to say, okay, I'm going to give a talk, but open it up to any random question. But you know, for me to be able to see that, okay, at this point now 10 of you didn't follow what I just said, we're going to stop here and then we'll, we'll discuss it. So I think it could be really useful not just in changing how the audience reacts, but how speakers take on their task. I have, I have two children, so I have some familiarity with it. Um, but I think, well, I think what, backing up a little bit on that, you know, I think, and there you get into interesting issues with a six-year-old because there's the question, you know, so usually I get questions like that with, you know, 17-year-olds like this more. You know, I think with six-year-olds, there is a whole question about what is their idea of what's real. You know, they are young enough so that reality is, is a little, is quite different. You know, so it, you know, it may be not metaphorical that they think this is real. Um, and that there may be a lot of things. And they're, you know, at six years old, they, they still have, um, many children still believe in imaginary beings they've been told about, you know, I don't know if you have a tooth fairy here, but yeah, you know, some of them are at the verge of knowing it's not real, and some really think that there's this fairy flying around, leaving you know shekels under their pillow. But um, you know, I think 
but I think for a lot of these technologies do have big age differences, and they're not just about adoption, but for instance, um, you know, a lot of people, for instance, Sherry Turkle, whose work I like very much, if you're familiar with it, did a lot of work about identity play, but the one piece I'm uncomfortable about with her work is she didn't really make allowance for the fact that she was looking at 16-year-olds and which is an age where a lot of people are going through issues about what their identity is and everything, that it wasn't necessarily all about the technology, but if she had spoken to 16-year-olds who weren't using technologies at all, they were playing around with different identities also, and that, they're, you know, that it's a very different thing if you're 50 and playing with different identities, then it might be more about the technology or what it lets loose. So, you know, I think for the, um, for the six-year-old, you know, some of the questions are with games, you know, what are you, you know, what is the benefit of using webcams? Is this fabulous that they're getting this imaginary world or is it very disturbing? I think we don't know that yet for kids that young. Um, but the whole, and I think it, it, it also speaks to a whole series of questions about what is the role of make-believe at different stages that, you know, uh, again, on Wednesday, I'm going to be talking a lot about deception, and maybe in some other language there's better words for it, but we don't have a very good vocabulary for understanding this whole range of things between make-believe and outright lies. So it's hard, you know, it's hard to even articulate what is a child's relationship to a teddy bear. You know, do they know where they have been the one to make it do all the animating? Left to itself, it's just lying there but they may really feel that it's real, and it's hard to get at to what extent do they believe that or not, and to what extent is that very different when the act of making it animated is coming from an external force. So, I think it, it tends to be very, very different by different sites, and that there are different expectations. So, um, you know, a lot of the, very few of those have really looked at history, and the questions that come up in the profile tend to be a little different than what you would see in history, because the history doesn't ask you, the profile doesn't ask you, are you responsive when people need advice, which is a lot of what your hist the history will say. And history is really more, tends to be, at least what we've been looking at has been more about sort of your interactions with others. Um, and even the, the truthfulness of profiles, people have looked up things like, you know, how truthful are people in dating sites? You know, how truthful are people in networking sites? And how, how does that compare? But, um, you know, part of the issue there is how, you know, and some places people come to feeling that, you know, this is a fantasy space, I can make up whoever I want to be. And some, you know, there's a clear expectation so that if they're making things up, it's clearly, they know they're going against the mores of the space, so. But it's, um, but I think that the issues that come up in the history, it's not so much, I mean, certainly you could say you could catch someone, you know, who's pretending to be a woman when they're not, but I think the, the point of doing those histories is more about just sort of seeing levels of engagement and long-term sort of topics and interests and ways of relating to others, which is somewhat um, complementary to the profile information. I, you know, I, I don't think there's a single answer to that because you can look at, you know, and even if you look at, for instance, when we started out, we were doing a lot of work with Usenet news groups, which were very interesting because it's the same, you'd have all these different news groups, they had the exact same technology, and you had just vastly different behaviors by topic, some of it was by chance. So it's, it's a little hard to make blanket statements, because you know, there you'd say, okay, you have no profile, but you have an address, you have this interface. What, what kind of interaction do you get? Well, you get all kinds of interactions. It depends on, on topics. If people have photographs, you certainly, it's not so much I think that you get more or less interaction, but people will read context from the photograph. So let's just you know, leave aside fake photographs for now, but you would certainly get um, all the sort of social reactions. If you see someone is much older, you would respond to them in a particular way because you know their age. If you saw their photograph and were pretty clear that they were, you know, 10 years old, it gives you a very different context for seeing them. So it's not so much that these change the quantity of the interactions, but they, they will bring in or eliminate 
things that people bring in, for in, in the case of photographs, for instance, from their existing um, knowledge of how to behave to different types of people, which can be good or bad, you know, in different circumstances. So there's, there's not, I don't think there's much evidence that anything that you do in a profile like that is going to be the, the thing that changes how much people interact, though it can change um, how they interact. Um, I th what I think, or what I would hope happens, I think there will be um, some additional visual, I mean, I, I'm very interested, obviously, in, in history, and I think that being able to both map out those relationships and see them is going to be increasingly important to people over time, and also being able to see a lot of how things have changed over time will be useful for them. Um, exactly how they will do this, it's, you know, I think is still open. I think, though I think for social networks, it's a, the issue is less the history. I think what, where they haven't done anything at all, and well, we've done some work in this, it wasn't anything I talked about today. Um, I think the biggest problem facing a lot of the network sites is there's not a good way of maintaining some kinds of subtle privacy control. So right now, if you have, you know, you're connected to people from work, you're connected to people in your family, you're connected to different sets of friends. Sometimes that can all be fine. It's really fascinating to see how your work friends relate to their family. But at some point, it, it starts being very limiting. You know, you start to say, I don't want to say anything at all because nothing I can say is really appropriate for all these people. Um, and so I think they're going to have to help people find ways to be able to divide up these different groups and be able to address pieces of it or interact with different pieces. And I think one of the things that stopped them from doing that so far is if you do it with little pull-down menus and things which Facebook has, you can, you can start doing some interesting privacy things. It becomes quickly so convoluted and confusing that one, most people don't do it. And secondly, you're always sitting here thinking, I think this will make it so that this message goes to these people and not these people, but it might be the opposite. So I think, and, then, and I'll really be in trouble. Um, and I think there, there's a lot of ways you can approach that as a graphical problem that will make it m much simpler. But that, I, you know, we've done some work in that area, but I haven't seen any site even approach that. Well, I don't, I don't know of any, um, if you're asking for visualization works that deal specifically with issues of inclusion or uninclusion. I think part of the idea is that, I don't know of any that are specifically addressing that, but part of the idea is to be drawing out patterns that are otherwise hidden. So you can have something, for instance, if you, um, you know, you could, going back to, for instance, the people garden, we'll forget about the problem with the flower metaphor, um, you know, the whole side, you can say, well, it's very gender-based. It makes everyone look like a nice girl with flowers in their hair. But, um, yeah, I think part of it is to say, um, at the heart of your question is, what is the important data to be looking at? You know, in this case, we mapped how much someone participated and, you know, things like that onto it. But if you want, if you're, question, if you're interested in things like inclusion of different groups, what you want to do is start mapping what, are, what do you think the different groups are here? And then see, you know, is this person never responded to? Are all the people who fall into this category not getting responses? So I think the, the issue is there is less in the types of representation, you know, but any kind of visualization work deals with two big questions. Is one, what is the relevant data to look at? And you know, if you look at a discussion group, there's thousands of possible things. You know, we just scratched the surface by starting with the most basic ones, you know, who's responded to, who's not. Once you start saying, okay, well, I'm going to start dividing people by gender and looking at that, or I'm going to divide people in some other way, you'll get very different um, information about what are the underlying patterns. I don't know if that answers. I, I, mean, I haven't done that much research in that area, but a lot has been done around, I think, with the well in California was a very... Um, there's, so there's some papers that deal with that there. The well was a... Um, one of the earliest online discussion groups, and they let people um, leave. When, when people left the group, they were allowed to erase everything they had ever written. 
and there was both a very strong sense of whether that should, there were huge arguments about whether that should be allowed. Um, there were a lot of arguments about um, whether it was the right thing to do. There's a, a set of studies, I can't, unfortunately I can't think offhand, I'll send it in later, who did them, but if you look up the well around who owned this information, so it's not just whether the people themselves were attached to it, though most were, very few people ended up exercising that ability. Um, and, but also how attached to other people felt to that information and the question of who owned that. And that once you participate here, it's sort of a breakdown of that metaphor, but if I've been in a discussion with you, not only is it a matter of whether I own my own information, which was the, the motto of the well was you are, own your words, but how much do you own what other people have said because that's the context of everything you have said. So I think it's about the attachment to things that you say, but sort of your attachment to a, to a whole cooperative history together. And I think a lot of the, the work there is based around the well. Then there's other work that uh, deals in general with the value of pseudon pseudonymy, where you can still be anonymous, but people really care a lot about reputation. And then the rest of the literature tends to be sort of the general reputation literature because you know, how much do people value reputation in general? Okay. Yes, um, I mean, there's certainly lots of people who, lots of people have looked at emoticons. Um, there's, did, are you familiar with the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication? So there's been a number of studies in there looking at how people use photographs and how they, they send photographic media and what they choose to send. There are um, a couple of people, um, a woman, Marty Hurst at Berkeley, has looked at how people use photographs in sending them, and there's there's a fair amount of work now on you know how people send photographs, but there's um, not I mean I, not much on the visualization of those. Um, I think the person who's looked at um, Ben Schneiderman does a lot of visualization work, and he's done some work with doing sort of whole photo gallery visualization. So it's like an advertisement. Um, that's, that's actually the topic of my Wednesday talk is all based on Zahavi's work and using signaling theory to analyze online communication is exactly that. So yes, I think it's a really, really interesting approach. Yes, thank you. <laughs>